This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Right, well, thank you all for coming, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Sean French and Nicky Gerard, Gerard? Gerard. Gerard, who, who write together as Nicky French, and uh, I discovered from reading their blog that they met, their first date was in, well, Harry met Sam, no. the second date was that first purely fiction, which kind of shows uh, the power of film, although it can be, or so the blog said, that everyone did it. I can go to everyone who goes to when Harry met Sally on the first day, it ends up getting married. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful, you go to see it with um, But uh, Sean and Nikki have both worked as um, journalists. Uh, Sean is a critic, including as a film critic. Nikki kind of features and interviews, is that correct? Just a bit, I mean, mostly features and interviews, so profile or something. And um, began, I'm not sure, when was the first book? Yeah, to our short right. dates. Right. Our first, our first joint book published in 1997. Right. So, um, but what they're talking about today is kind of the process of being adapted. And I think the first adaptation was 2002, is that correct? Yeah, so. Right. So, um, but kind of what's interesting is that they've been adapted for film and television. They've been adapted kind of maybe happily and not quite so happily. <laughs> um, um, also been adapted for ongoing series and for single dramas. Um, the, with the format will be that they're going to begin by talking um, about. Somebody to the Jill, yes? <laughs> uh, well, I'm just about to start, so probably not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Somebody, sorry, I'm going to switch my phone off and um, say my apologies to somebody who is intended to be here. Anyway, um, my apologies for um, the interruption. And just to say that, yeah, they're going to talk about those experiences for about 40, 45 minutes and then take questions and uh, see. Um, where we get to from that. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, but it's lovely, it's lovely for us to be here. This is a different kind of thing. We, we've never done this before, so it's, it's a real pleasure for us. And so thank you for being here. And can I just start by saying that we're going to we're, we're going to talk about our various experiences, but at any time you should feel free to chip in, interrupt, disagree, ask questions, because what we really want is for it to be a conversation between all of us about this very strange process. Yeah, um, also I say that I, um, I, mean, I, I uh, grew up in a, my father, obviously my father was a film critic, and my, my father is very much, still is a film critic, and I grew up in a, in, so I've grown up in a household, so I've always obsessed with the cinema, and so, and, and so the kind of, I was always very interested in movies and the idea of, of working in some way, and, um, and I studied literature, so the kind of connection between, between books and, uh, and films was something I was always really, always interested in. And I, I suppose I, I just say in advance, I had a chance. I think I had this sort of idea about what what uh, being someone who'd written a book, having it made into a film, was like. And I assumed that what you were, you know, that you were, you were closely involved with the film at every stage, and you were really kind of part of the whole thing. And um, you know, in fact, our experience has been very. We've had all kinds of different experiences. So we'll, what we what we do is, if you want to go book by book, uh, this sounds this sounds a bit grim, but, uh, and in, in the order in which we wrote them, and give a kind of brief account of, of the kind of ways we um, uh, of what happened. Before, before we even begin, I want to have there's a kind of almost like you know an overarching thing that I want to say about it, which is that there are quite a lot of authors who have their novels made into films and they get very very critical about it and rather aggrieved 
and are quite unhappy about it, and they feel betrayed often by their, you know, their beautiful, beloved book being somehow kind of corrupted in, in the act or something. And we never, you know, we haven't, we, we've had experiences that haven't been entirely successful, but we've, we've never felt kind of hard done by about it, because after all, what you do is you sell, you know, you, you sell the option and you give away the rights, and what you want the film, and you just want the film to kind of reimagine and refigure what you've done. And when it goes wrong, it's often, it's often, it doesn't feel like anyone's fault, it just feels like bad luck or something. Mm. So, so anyway. we speak about it in the spirit of kind of optimism that it's going to get better and better in the future. Anyway, our first, the first book we put, we put, wrote, we wrote in 95 and it was published in 97, it's called Memory Game. And, um, and it, was, it was optioned. I'm sure everyone here knows what to do in the process. I don't know if I need to explain that, that, that you don't. Uh, I think often there's a big... The, the, I get used to seeing in newspapers, I say some, some authors have been paid a million pounds for their book, for their new book. And what that really means is that it's, a, it's you know, that, uh, that would be a million pounds if the film was made and it took a certain amount of money at the box office. But uh, it would probably been paid like 15,000 pounds or something like that. And, um, Anyway, our first book, The Memory Game, was optioned, and I've actually written here, optioned in quotation marks, because it was optioned by, by a friend, a school friend of Mickey, who, uh, who was, who, who um, was, a, he did, I mean, that's not as crazy as it sounds, he was working in the, um, he was working in the movie business as a production designer, and wanted to get into producing, and, uh, and he was a, he'd been worked, and close friend of someone who'd been a producer on the Inspector Moore's programs, so they, um, they had the idea, they came to us, and the kind of carrot they offered us, not only would it be made by the BBC, but, um, but we, we, we adapted ourselves. And uh, we, we, we've, we've twice been involved in trying to adapt our own work, and now got quite decided feelings about whether authors should adapt their own work. And then, so we actually did, we, we, so we had this quite arduous process where we, um, where we well, spent a lot of time with them working, you know, trying to knock this book into shape for a mini-series on TV. We went, we went to see a BBC producer, and we actually pitched it ourselves, Nikki and I, in, in this office of the producer. And it was turned down, and, uh, and uh, they never paid us. They never paid us for the option. Uh, and uh, and, and so, then we discovered that after the option elapsed, there was still the option that they never paid us for elapsed. They were still going around trying to sell it in our, in our name. Um, but we, we took, we took, we did have a small amount of revenge. Very childish revenge. <laughs> we, we turned them into two very ineffectual cops in the next book. We <laughs> yeah, their actual names. And then, and then, um, and then, in fact, then the, uh, the memory game a few years later got option again. And then, and, um, and then, there's very different levels of cooperation. Some of the people show you what they've done, and usually they don't. But in this case, they, um, we, we were actually sent a script when it was just at the time when the option came up for renewal after a year. And then we did this, the only time we ever did this, the, the script was so, it was such a total farago that we actually stopped the counting the option and that was the last, that was, as far as that went. Our second book that came out the, in the following year, it's called Safe House. And that was with, with, um, with, with really very little trouble made into a yeah, it was made. Two, 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 two part ITV drama. It was written by David Curry, people may know as uh, he writes in the Bible of Crime uh, script, directed by Simon Massey. And already, I think we may have been teaching, showing the script. We did appear briefly as extras in it, we went to during the shooting. And um, well, the we took extras, it was a very it was in a school playground. So this is Sean and I were being parents and our children were there as well, and they were children running out. And I think I got cut out entirely. And I think that children were just briefly seen, but the camera focused along and our shore were hanging around all by himself wearing strange jackets in the corner of the playground. <laughs> Decidedly suspicious. And well, and all the books we've written, Safe House, are probably the most kind of complicated detective stories. It's a very difficult book to adapt, and it was very, I mean, it was, it was very easy. We almost, it was almost like an Agatha Christie story. So it was a real challenge for David Perry, which he kind of just about managed. But, and then it was a real uh, uh, ITV story that it was, when it was broadcast, um, uh, they had a right on about half an hour before transmission, they suddenly sold an extra commercial break, and they, cut, they had to cut 10 minutes out, with literally about an hour to go. So, so apparently to anyone who watched it, it made no sense at all. <laughs> 
our third, our, no, the third, the third book we wrote, which was a kind of, which was um, called Killing Me Softly, we're going to save to the end because that's the kind of that, that's the kind of the most um, in, that's the most kind of dramatic experience we've had. In, so I think we really need to build up to that one. Um, then uh, the, uh, uh, the, the our fourth book is called Beneath the Skin, which was. Um, which was a, it's quite a kind of challenging book to do. And it's, it, we had the, the the idea behind it was to have um, we, the, it was to have we, uh, most of our earlier books were narrated, were told in the first person, and this was we had the idea of telling the same story three times in a row, told told by different female heroines, and we we and we wanted to try and give away, but it was trying to sort of take about what are the kind of limits on what you can do with a first person narrative. So it was a real challenge to. Um, to, uh, we were, um, we, uh, and in that case, we were actually, for the very first time, we were actually, uh, this was bought originally, it's optioned for a buy, it was, it was, it was very glamorous, so we were optioned, it was going to be made into a Hollywood film. And uh, so we had a, so we were actually, we, there was one occasion when we had what I had imagined as a teenager, having your book optioned by a Hollywood studio's life, that we were, we flew out to, they said we had to fly, fly to meet the producer, so Nikki and I were flown out to, to Los Angeles. And uh, what we had anticipated, we, in order for us to adapt our own book, and so what we, had, we were going to spend three days there, and we thought, well, clearly we're going to be spending like eight hours a day hacking out, working out exactly how this is going to be done. It turned out we'd flown over there for a half hour meeting, <laughs> and, and uh, we then flew back. And uh, it was a very, very casual meeting as well. It wasn't even focused, very focused. And we flew back wrote, and we wrote, I think, two or three drafts, and then nothing came of it at all. And it was a very strange experience because it became clear that we wrote, we wrote a draft. <laughs> <laughs> and then we realised that we were going to and send it to them. And they wouldn't really comment except to kind of just slightly beckon us in a different direction. And I think it became clear to us that it was actually. They wanted something very different, but they weren't really going to tell us what they wanted. I think what they wanted is to get rid of that three persons, that three kind of like that strand of three narratives, and have just one heroic woman at the centre with whom everyone could identify. But they never quite told us that, so we just wrote. It was like a botched experience, really, of delivering the scripts and thinking that they were. And I think in a way, I really think it was our fault because I think we went into it uh, into trying to screen writers while, while writing as novelists. So we kind of read it. What we it all said, you know, if there's a you know, we would write something and we say, well, you we don't like it. So if you can tell us, then we'll fix it. But in a way, it's that the, the screenwriting, I think the screenwriting relation to a producer is so completely different to a novelist's relation to your editor that we never got, so we never got past that. Uh, you know what the what that was like. So I think we were just and probably talking past each other. probably remain too faithful to our own book. We were probably not harsh enough. I had a very strange. I have to say this was um, uh, this happened. I think in something like two thousand and three. And I woke up in the night about two months ago and I hadn't thought how we should have written the script. <laughs> <laughs> it was unfortunately rather too late because it was then later actually that that lapsed and was then made into a, a about two years later was made into a, into a TV film. Um, where we again we uh, you know we have to, actually I went the, again the very one of the things is, is getting very little involved I think we may have read the script I, I remember going, I went to the read through the first cast read through which was kind of a symbolic mm -hmm. thing which is very and one of the it's always very one of the lovely things when you're a, as a writer to go to even to go into the to the world of film or theatre or something it's just he suddenly meets lots of people, and you know, so instead of having, you know, it's very nice. At least with us, we have two of us working on it. But suddenly, we see a kind of collaborative medium, and all the actors. It's just a very strange thing of having characters that you invented, that we invented in a room a couple of years earlier, actually being people thinking you know, actually an actor trying to inhabit that, and it become. And, it, and one of the interesting things we could maybe talk about later is how different. That process, you know, and this, you know, how different the character has to become when it can't, when, when it has to be embodied, and that, you know, you can't, you know, there's certain kinds of ambiguity you can't have, and you know, and, and different things where you can be. Our next book is called Red Room. So what we're not doing is we're not saying that we like this. The problem, I think, the problem was that in a way, the um, it was, I think, it was, it was, I think, it was very, I think, it was well done, but there's a. I think that there's always, again, another thing is, is 
when when you write something as a book, you know, and one of we've making a try we've tried to do in various of our books is to try and do certain kinds of ex uh, narrative experiments in which work as a book. And if you if you try if you recast it as a film, then you have to think: Does that kind of experiment, does this formal thing work on the screen? And sh or should you try and do it something that's a bit different? And I, and I think that once you you know once you take a a um, uh, first person narrative and put it onto the screen, you're already making a massive change because instead of you know what we can do and we constantly do is you constantly see it from the you know, main person's point of view and then and you can play tricks, narrative tricks with that, the things they don't see. But of course you know, you know, you know, you know when you see showing as a film then you, do, you don't have that interior world obviously, so everything has to be done from a different angle, doesn't it? Mm. That's what you're saying. Mm. Anyway, our next book, The Red Room, we had, we, 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 we had a meeting with that about, that was, a, a bit, uh, was going to be produced by we the BBC producer. And we certainly, certainly said, we had a really good idea for that, we thought we could produce it. And, put it, and that was the end, that project ended. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and it was then... Uh, but then it got an option again, to be done by an independent for Channel 4, I think it was, and a very yes, uh, a writer called Jack Paul, you might know of, in several episodes, The Skinned, for instance. Um, he, put, he did write the script for it, he was sent, and it was very good, but it was much more like an episode of The Skinned than it was like Skinned, mm. Skinned, skin, skin, than it was like our book. It was almost unrecognisable, and then it went into development, and then it also just, just, just cancelled cancel at the last minute. And then there's, um, there's another example of how, I mean, some, you know, on most, when, when we've done th things for TV, you're kind of, people tend to send you the script and you can come and visit the, the set and things like that. And it's, you know, it's kind of very polite and friendly. Here's an example, an example of a real bit of different, um, uh, uh, different kind of experiences. I'll put the book we did after that, which is called Land of the Living. And um, that, that was, Option and it was published in something like that in 2002. But it was, it was suddenly in 2007, it was optioned for a um, by a, for it to make a Hollywood, a Hollywood film. I think it was something like that, Warner, Warner Brothers or something. And uh, and what we heard immediately is that that uh, James Elroy was hired to write the script. Who we wrote LA Confidential and things like that. And uh, I got we got fantastically excited, of course. And this, and. For me, of course, what you immediately do, you know, always go to Google it and find out as well, you know, if you still know, you never get told anything, but you could. And, and uh, I immediately looked up James Elroy, and it turned out that this was his, not his first, it was his 14th screenplay, all, all, none of which had yet been reached the screen, so it would be immediately, you know, got less hopeful. And, uh, but then it, but we heard that the script had been written, and then it hung around for, for a couple of years, and then just like most of these things. You never hear, it, it was very unusual, it's not like the Red Room, and suddenly there was a phone call said, sorry, can't check, no, Channel 4 cancelled it, it's finished. But the, usually, you just don't hear anything. And in, the, in this case, with, with Land Living, we didn't hear anything. And, uh, and then, um, about in 2010, we heard suddenly the comment saying, no, no, it's not dead yet, they've got this indie pre uh, director, and it really, you no, know, we think it's going to happen. And then, uh, and then it went there uh, completely again. There were apparently more scripts were being written. I think something like by this time, like did five or six scripts had been written. James Elroy was long gone. And um, then, and, and again, it went completely dead. And then, very, then six months ago, completely out of the blue, we again were contacted. Saying, no, no, it's all happening again. It's, um, and uh, and we were, the, the same this producer, uh, Alex Alexander Dulcham, who we know we had no contact of any kind. At any stage, from, uh, we suddenly had known it all on again. There's a new script written uh, by um, uh, this man called Sean Gullett, who, who you get you go to the IMDb, and it's a, he's this lead. If anyone's seen not a lot, not the life of Pi, but Pi, from Pi, he was a thriller. Mm -hmm. He was a star. He was a leading actor in it and co-writer. And he's for some reason, for some reason, he's now written the script of Land of the Living. And we heard this, and it's been directed by a man called Olivier Megaton. Has <laughs> anyone heard of Olivier Megaton yet? Well, he's not his real name. He was a, he's a French director, and he's now he was he, he directed he's worked with Luc Besson, and directed, and but he's he's directed a film. We, we suddenly knew the film that was coming up. He's directed Taken Two, <laughs> you know, and uh, which uh, when Taken Two was released, it got the worst reviews I think I've almost ever seen. But, but wait, 
people we haven't got to the end of our list. But uh, it got terrible, terrible reviews, and we thought, that's it, the project is dead, you're, away, you're going to be But then Taken 2 turned out to be spectacular, not just the hit, but the spectacular hit. It's done really, really well. And it's described, I think our agent suddenly said, Olivia Megaton is now hotter than Hades. So, um, uh, but, uh, so I have to say, in anticipation of this, of this occasion, we did email our agent uh, this morning to say, is it actually, it's meant it's due to start shooting in January. Is it going to, is it going ahead? And uh, we haven't heard back. He was, to, he was going to contact our American agent to find out, but and it reminded the gold and um, the Woody Allen line, which is about, about the film business. It's, 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 uh, it's worse than dog eat dog if dog doesn't return dog's phone call. Who knows? The, the, I mean, the thing is, what, one of the things we discovered is n no news. Sometimes no news is bad news, and sometimes no news is good news. And suddenly you discover, oh no, that was cancelled a year ago, didn't you hear? Didn't anyone tell you? Or, oh no, it's going into, it's actually starting shooting tomorrow, didn't anyone tell you? you know, so, uh, so in this case, I mean, this is not, in this in the case of Land of Living, we've heard these things, but we've learned most of them, you know, but, but no, we've only heard it via our agent, and we would send a link to an announcement in the Hollywood Reporter, but no, we've heard no. It's like slightly kind of ominous description of the film's about, so it's, it's about a promiscuous woman who gets stuck, and you think, where does that come from? Anyway, so, well, no, we're very, anyway the, on the, next, the next book we wrote is a book called Secret Smile, which was adapted for, again, as a TV miniseries, um, which, which, which starred, um, and that, that was all fairly, very, very, that's very trouble-free, you know, as we starred David Tennant. In fact, and, uh, at the time where the, we went to the rap party uh, in Soho, and the, I mean, talking to David Tennant at this party, and what he said, you know, what are you doing next? And what he was doing next, the next day, and this is his first day as Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is what we do. We, we often go on set and we go to rap parties, so we have a kind of only time, no matter what's happening in the film. Mm -hmm. um, our, next, <laughs> our, next, uh, our next book is a book called Catch Me When I Fall, which is told in the first person by a woman who doesn't realise she's suffering from, uh, from the, doesn't realise she's bipolar, which has been, never, never been optioned. So I think it's been very challenging to... Awesome. The book after that was a book called Where Do You Want To? It's Losing You. I'm Losing You. It was the only, it was the only novel that we've written thus far in which we didn't think this is going to be made into a film. We almost thought of it as a film because it's the story of 15-year-old girl who goes missing and her mother desperately is trying to find her. She knows something is really wrong and she's trying to find her. And it takes place, it takes place on an island, on a, on a kind of spit of land that comes an island as the tide rises, on the shortest day of the year, so the light is fading. Mm -hmm. um, but also in real time. So the book takes about six and a half or seven hours to read, you just read it straight through. And it's it's, it's, it's the span of his action is about six and a half, seven hours of time, and there's not a single second that goes by that you don't know what the narrator is feeling and thinking and seeing. So everything she knows, you know. So it's like it's, you've envisaged it like one long shot, doesn't it? It never gets cut. And it's now been And it's now been uh, But it's only like in the last month. And uh, you could by the people, in fact, who, who made a TV version of our, of the, of our neck of the book we wrote after that, which is called What to Do When Someone Dies, uh, which was, which was, um, came up, which was shown like last year, as, uh, as it was called Without You, which again, that, uh, it was, it, there's a TV thing, it um, started with support, didn't it start? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, there's a... Anyway, so we, we read the script, saw, which we saw an early, again, saw an early rough cut of it. I mean, I, I appeared on a, on a question and answer thing with her. So, 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 anyway, uh, but, you know, that, that, and in fact, and the people who, um, you yeah, know, who, so we, we, and we, we've actually had a lot of contact with these, with the producers. It's it it really this woman called the little Sally Head, who's probably best known, she did um, uh, Prime Suspect, the, the thing that made that was a, such a big success with Helen Mirren, who created the whole idea of the camera and female detective on TV. Um, the book after that was a book called Complicit, which is not, it's never been optioned because it's probably not filmable. It's, 
the way it's, it's structured in a very peculiar it's way. It's and forwards, it's like two times days. Two, two times all the way through. Um, yeah, and, then, and, then, and then after that, we, we started doing something we've never... The first time we wrote the first book, the book called Blue Monday, which is the first book in the series. And that's been optioned by Sally Head, who's due to it, and, and, and with a plan that it will, it will be um, and that it will be done as a as a, as a possible series on TV. Uh, but and we've read the script of it, but, but it's still being worked out, and we don't know where it is. And then we've written the book after that, which is the second part of the series, which now brings us to uh, to the, the third book that we ever wrote together called um, Killing Soft. And that, that was made into a Hollywood movie. And I don't know if there's anyone heard of this Hollywood movie before, can you? <laughs> right. well, so, okay. so, well, the thing is, the thing with Kimmy Softly, that really broke, seemed to go against all the, all the kind of cynical things about me. It never really happens. You get, you, you get very, you don't get told anything. This was our first experience, it was really our first experience of selling an option to anything. It was just like, it was, it was so exciting. exciting. It was so well, exciting. From the very, I mean, from the very, I mean, it was very dramatic all the way along, which, because the, what happened, it didn't get optioned in a normal way. It was, it was, uh, it was the first book we wrote that was bought by an American publisher, and soon, and it, there was immediately we had, there was then the rights were they made, they offered for the rights even before we even sent it out to be, you know. To, to, to film people. So what had happened is apparently what happens a lot in America is they, have, they employ people in publishers as literally spies being illicitly photocopied in the publisher's office and then sent and then sent to a producer and then they made a, they then contacted our agent with an offer before he was and he'd been planning to send it out the next the um, so that was I mean, you know it was very exciting. We then announced the people who did it but it was it was a new company called Montecito. It was formed by this man at the top called, well, I'm right now, the director of Ghostbusters. And, and a very interesting man called Tom Pollock, who was, he had been in head of the Universal. And also, but, but before he was head of the Universal, he was a, an entertainment lawyer. And he was a very interesting entertainment lawyer because he signed the most brilliant contract in the whole of Hollywood history, by far. We, or at least he had the most clever bit of it. In, he was George Lucas's lawyer, and he signed the, the contract for Star Wars. And uh, people may, may know the story, but they had a very, very important clause where uh, George Lucas took a smaller fee in exchange for getting 100% of the merchandise rights. And so, I mean, that literally cost Universal about three billion dollars, all of which went to George Lucas. He built up his entire, his entire fortune was derived from that one clause, and Tom Holland died. So anyway, he'd now been fired from, from, from Universal, and uh, they took his company, and so they, um, they, well, the, very, the first thing they did is they contacted us and said they wanted to make, they said in order that part of the deal was we had to change the title of our novel, which they didn't just, we didn't just finish writing, it was originally called it, and it was crazy for me. And they said, no, they had to, so we had a lot of pain to get to thinking of a new cycle. pain and drink. And uh, then, what, and then again, what um, the uh, what people again, you, see, you know, but what what everyone told us is, you know, of course it seems so exciting now, but it won't happen. Well, the very next thing that happened, you know, within about two weeks, we were, you know, we heard the script had was has been um, had been written, and uh, and then they sent us. They were very very. And one of the interesting things about that is that doing that experience, it was kind of something interesting ending, but it was. It was very, very pleasant, but everyone involved was extremely nice. And they sent us a script, which we read. By a woman, she, she never, it's her first screenplay. No, it was her last screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> it really was, it was, it was a, you can say it was a mm. it was a terrible script. I mean, you know, and I was not used to reading scripts at all, but it was such a cloth script. And it just got, also, you could tell, you know, you could easily, it was just in that incompetence as well. So, for instance, when Izzo was saying, Oxfordshire, she said Oxon, because that's what the cross is Oxfordshire. It was just little things like that. And it was it was it was dire as a script. And it did this thing is it, it changed the killer. So it changed the whole kind of domain of the book. And it, in, in our view it made the thriller just a kind of nonsense really. And it was interesting because we were we were terribly I mean we've always been really clear that when you sell, when you hand 
your uh, book over to someone. You, you, uh, what we will never have wanted is for it, it wasn't, it's not important quality to be faithful to. What you, in fact, it's the opposite. You want them to take it and really make it their own and make it work as a film. And that made me, it has to work. Since our, our books are about 100,000 words long, to make it any kind of feature film, you obviously have to throw out three quarters of it and cut jettison characters and merge others and create new incidents and shape them. So, you know, so you're in a kind of, you know, and, uh, and so you're always in a kind of awkward position. But, um, but we, uh, we, we, sort of, we sat down together and wrote this very, very careful email, just saying not, you know, please restore it to our, the beautiful words that we wrote. But look at this bit. Do you see that we feel that this doesn't follow from this bit? And if, you're, if the excitement depends on this at the beginning, and then this happens at the end, then it ruins the whole, you know. And anyway, we just, you know, we got this very polite letter about, you know, email back saying, you know, you know, we decided to go in this direction, it's fine. And so we, we, had, we had this feeling, well, you know, we, you know, we write books. They, they're in the film industry, you know, they, they kind of know about this. And But also partly we thought, this is just, it's, you know, in a way it doesn't matter because it's so bad, but it will never, now, no, they'll never get anyone to be in it. And anyway, anyway, about a week later, they signed Heather Graham to be in the lead. And, uh, you know, and, and, then, and then the next was all going, and Joseph and Fines, and it was all going into production. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yes, and it's and also... The director was Ted Kiger, who's a very, very, I don't know if you know, he's a wonderful director, and he directs kind of Chinese historic epics, and he, he doesn't really speak English, so he didn't really ask about the script either, because he couldn't read it. Anyway, but, 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 you, and, but anyway, we, but, but, but by the stage we thought, well, we were clearly wrong with all these other people, and you know, it's, you know, and it's all happening. And, the, and, and, and for the next like few months, we had a very pleasant time. In the, you know, they, you know, they came, the filmers they came to the film was shot in in London, partly and, and around. And so we, you know, we, we, spoke, we had very, you know, we had dinner with the producers who were, who were, who were lovely people, and they came out to our house and. And we went on the set and watched it. And there, and there's a couple, and there is such kind of, I mean, you know, it's very boring for you, but very interesting for us, which is that if you've constructed a little scene where two people meet in the street, and then you go, and in order to do that as a film, they have to hire, close down the street and hire traffic and have people walking up and down. And there's just that strange kind of things that you've sketched out, you know, in a, you know it, was, it was raining a bit. You know, they can't just have that. You've got to have shops and things and people and that sort of thing. And the more you go on the set, um, the more you think, this guy, the, 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 these people are so good at their job. It's going to be, you know, can't, what could go wrong, you know? And uh, and and then um, and we went. To, <laughs> <laughs> we went to the um, we went to the uh, you know we went to, to we went into the studio. And there's this, there's the, there's a crucial scene of the film it's shot up in it's shot in a graveyard up in on the auction walls or something. And the weather had been too bad to shoot it, so they had to cancel it and recreate the whole thing inside, they rebuild this church and churchyard inside our Shepparton studio. And it wasn't just a work, it was just staggering. It was a great work of art. You know, <laughs> uh, anyway, the, it was really all went well until we went to the, um, we went to the, we went to the cast and crew screening, and, um, which was... Uh, yeah, well, all we say, we didn't need to cut the... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we actually left through the fire escape at the end. We just didn't know what to say to all these lovely people. It was not. I said, I'm talking about one line. It's a Bradshaw. The first line. The first line. Okay. Turkeys don't come plumper than this. It's a jaw dropping catastrophe of the movie. A gruesome multiple pile up of reputations. So. <laughs> in, in preparation for, I'd say, in preparation for coming, for coming here, um, I, uh, I looked up on the Rotten Tomatoes website, and it had to say, it's, you know, it's quite an impressive achievement for films to get 0% on the rock and roll. So, so it was... Um, also, we hoped, we hoped that because it was so bad, it would just go straight onto DVD or be forgotten. But it was so bad, it became mm. like a cult bad film. Mm. So every time there are lists of bad films or terrible scenes, it pops up again. <laughs> I mean, the, the funny thing is, in a way, the, um, and you know, as a, you know, people who've been adapted, I mean, even, I mean, I think what is you know, interesting is that I think when people talk about bad experiences, but it was, I think there are worse experiences because, there, there, because one of the things that often happens in the film industry is very, kind of, they can be very cruel behaviour or very kind of 
uh, you know, people they were kind of, you know, because I think that actually everyone, you know, it was people were very kind of nice about it, and people were even quite nice about it afterwards, you know. There were a few, a few people suffered. In fact, I think the people who suffered really were the people who were more directly involved in making it. And the I think one thing we felt was, actually in the years since, people do have come up to us very sympathetically and said, you know, we'll put a hand and think, you know, do you feel terribly scarred by it? And, you know, and actually, I think it's that we were the, I mean, you know, the book still, I mean, one thing about being adapted is you've got the film and you hope it's really good and it's something different. But the book, you know, they don't take the book away and pulp it and change it, you know, still, the book still survives in some form. So, in a way, I think it wasn't a, you know, you know when you feel it feels okay about it, you know? Because there are some books that get made into films and it actually damages the books. There are the book, there are mm -hmm. examples like Captain Colors and Mandolin, which goes to sales, dropped off after the film came out. I don't think that's mm -hmm. happening. But, but then, but that, but, but then, you know, but in a way that, you know, if, um, if, you know, that's, you know, that's, 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 I mean, so we've had all different kinds of experiences, but we're still, well, we're still very hopeful, and uh, we're we're still, and there are one, you know, so the things, you know, we're really, you know, looking forward to seeing, you know, maybe next year we'll all be going to see the Olivier Megaton version of the Bernard Louis, you know, to give us a great triumph, you know, you know, you can't, you'll get better than all the sense, and not be smart, you know. Um, so maybe, maybe there's a way if anyone has, you know, I don't know if people would want to ask anything or talk, or talk or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, thank you very much indeed for yeah. the conversation and the guidance through mm -hmm. your experience. There's a question which I would like to ask, perhaps to kick things off, which is, you've talked a lot about, as novelists, ex for the formal experiments that you're wanting to do in terms of point of view or using time or whatever, and the difficulty of translating those filmically, because once things became, become embodied, as you said, and become externalized. Are you, but you also seem, well, are, I mean, enormously filmically literate, like you described Sean growing up, and the, you know, plus the experiences that you've been through. Um, how, are you also interested in exploring kind of the possibility of that kind of formal experimentation in film or to write something that would be, that you mentioned um, when talking about um, is it losing it or losing it? Losing it, you know, the, the, the one which existed in real time, which is kind of <coughs> filmic motion in some ways. So are you, would you also think about writing something that uses filmic Experimentation in the ways that films now kind of are using. Uh, you mean well, well, writing a novel that explores. Well, 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 I mean, I think it's very definitely, and I think it happens. I think lots and lots of novels are so influenced by film now, and of course, you know, so, especially Sean being so soaked in film, of course, there, you know, there are things like kind of, you know, kind of freezing things or flashbacks or, or just ways of using kind of language you learn in film. And all, you know, of course, what we don't do is we, I don't, I think it would not work to say that we would write a novel thinking of it. As a future film, because the two things are so very different, and that would seem to kind of, you know, not work for either of them. But definitely, I mean, the, I mean, in a way, I think just, I think, I mean, I, mean, I think that the kinds of, of thrillers that, you know, which, we, you know, we think of the kind of Hitchcock we use, things like Rear Window, or, I mean, it's and also it's interesting that, the, I mean, one of the things with formal experiments is the ones that work and the ones that don't work. I mean, from, you know, I don't know, I mean, maybe people disagree, but I mean, I think Rear Window is kind of that restriction of the viewpoint works fantastically powerful, powerfully, whereas I think the single take thing in rope doesn't quite, you know, you know, I mean, you can sort of see intellectually why it does it, but it doesn't work emotionally, and, you know, uh, and, uh, but, but I think that in a way, they, I think they, they sort of high concept things are kind of, are, are, are really interesting. Mm. So, well, thank you. Questions?
You mentioned earlier on about the editor, um, the writer-editor relationship, and different and being very different to the one in, in film to the producer. I just wondered, and I'm really interested in producer-writer relationships. Whether you could just talk a bit more about the editor-writer relationship in comparison. Well, the, um, I mean, as I understand it, one of the things is in, in one of the things about the, script, about the screenwriter, as a related, you know, related to a producer or director, is your, um, except for very particular. In very particular exceptions, you're a kind of writer for hire, so you're really trying to supply things which you know, you know, you're, you're not really in control of your. And the producer's you know, like your boss. Right? Yeah. Um, so they can tell you what to do, and they can tell you what to change, and they and and so you're you're at the kind of back, you're you're trying to kind of perform the task that they're setting you as a writer. You know, when they kind of want, you know, there are many kind of terrifying things about being a writer, like being just sitting at home, you know. Room with a blank screen, um, facing silence. But the wonderful thing is, is that it's, it's, you, it's yours. You own it, and you're responsible. And you can do anything. You can do as a writer. You can do absolutely anything. And then you give it to us. And of course, they can say no, we don't want to publish it. Or they can make suggestions. But you don't need to obey. It's your work, and you have kind of ownership of it, which doesn't exist in any way the same as in a screenwriter. I mean, we have a relationship with our editor, which is just very kind of careful and productive, and it's about suggestions and... I mean, the funny, of course, as soon as one thinks of it, there are kind of exceptions, because there are famous examples of, you know, there's certain... Uh, I'm not, I forgot his name, but yeah, whoever... I mean, Raymond Carver's editor was... Go on, uh, with. Yeah, well, was, was, who played such an important part in editing Raymond Carver that it's kind of, you almost should get joint credit for the, you know, Raymond Carver should be a thing in quotation marks that was created by this editor, wasn't he? Because he's the kind of the comic style of, you know, this, you know, this editor, you know, really... Whereas there are other, I think, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are people in this room who know much more than I do about this, but I think, well, I think for example, I think the deal was if you hired Harold Pinter as a, as a screen, to write a screenplay, you didn't just, you know, send them to rewrite or get people to rewrite it. You had a certain kind of authorial control. But that's very, very unusual, I think. Because yeah. I suppose that's the other thing with screenwriters is that often there are multiple, multiple screenwriters in versions, which is not true of writing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, when, I mean, I mean, even the bit when you and I have done the bits of, you know, the pattern that's worked at least a bit on the screenwriting projects, it, in a way it's rather fun because it's just so different. I mean, in, you know, basically when we write one of our books together, when we show it to anyone else at all, we basically have the feeling that this is going to be a finished object that can be published. And of course, of course it isn't, because people, you know, always editors and different people have, you know, the, you know, the input is important. But there's a, the, a theoretically feeling that that's, you know, that's the thing that's been made. Whereas, you know, when you, you know, actually, you know, the, 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 the writing screenplay, you, you don't, you wouldn't even think of, produ of producing the finished screenplay before, you know, it involves sitting down with the producers and the people saying, this is the kind of thing, this, you know, does it work in this way? I, you know, you go through so many stages. There's much more. This this kind of thing that has to be negotiated, and it depends on, and then it depends on kind of budget. As Nikki was saying, one of the great things with books is you don't, you don't have to think about budget. You can have a big crowd scene. You can have it, you know, anywhere. You know, so I think it's, it's you know, it's just completely. Different. What is about? I mean, writing is so much about the interiority. It's about sinking in, you sink down inside yourself, and you can find the world there. Whereas I, mean, I don't, you know, I, I don't know if this is true, but it seems to me that writing a screenplay is very kind of external, and it's about structure, and it's about collaboration, and talking to other people. So it doesn't have that sense of, kind of disappearing inside yourself. <coughs> yeah. Just leading on from that question, mm -hmm. then, do you, are you not tempted to, if, if perhaps what you've been describing tonight seems to be as a novelist, you lose obviously quite a lot of control when something is adapted, and you seem very comfortable with that. But at the same time, is it not a kind of logical step to think perhaps you want to direct the you know kind of the whole world of writer directors that obviously may maintain more control over their ideas? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thought. But I think I feel I mean. Would it be better, would we be happier if we controlled our own progress and one of our own books to the screen? I'd be so unhappy. 
<laughs> I mean, I think we're absolutely. In fact, I think you know, I, I, I think if, I mean, Nick and I have. You know, when we talk about this idea of doing other stuff, doing uh, writing either scripts, either film, or doing, I mean, always do much, much rather do something, something new, some a different idea. Because, and in lots of ways, the kind of I think if you adapt someone, if you adapt your own book, you really, I think. Almost always, you're the wrong person to do it because you just you've got you haven't got you haven't got the distance and you you get the, you've got the wrong kind of thing because, you, because what you what you know what you, what you see when you were constructing it originally you, you know, is not that's not helpful to whether it's going to work as a as a, um, as a film. I, mean, I just remember when um, the, the Anthony Miguel told the story about when he was adapting the English patient. He said that. Uh, he met uh, Michael Mandachi and he said, Do you realize I'm going to destroy your novel? And Mandachi apparently it was a good sport and said, No, no, go ahead. You know. But of course, that's what you have to do. I, mean, I think it's, you know, you know, I think, I think something about the, the some essence of your novel that needs to be kind of in some way preserved and sweet. I mean, I mean, when I just, you know, when I think over and over again, when you look at the really good adaptations of of books, and they have free. There is an essence there. If you take something like Grace and Scott's Yeah. There's so much good things which are actually in the book. There's so little. I mean, it's interesting. I've seen the David Green version of Great Expectation. It's staggering how it's like a kind of just a few selections from the book almost, and that's why it's so powerful. It seems like it's it almost like what you might remember of the book when you like two years after you read it. You know? Yeah, that's it. That seems to be a question. Well, you sort of covered it, actually, but I'm, just, I'm just going to, to pick up on the same thing. You said that you read a crazy of one of your screenplays, that had, one of your books has been adapted, and you didn't really recognise it. <laughs> And I just, uh, so I was just going to say, you know, what, how far do you think people can go before it just becomes something completely different? I, I, I mean, when you, when you sell rights to your novels, is there some kind of clause which said, well, which says, well, you know, if you change this much, it's actually not the same piece yeah, of work anymore? Couldn't, they couldn't insist on anything. Really, yeah. But then they couldn't buy it. There is, we've never, there's been no clause, and you know, the, 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 the trouble is that. Sean saying they should change it as much as they want, and that's absolutely true until they change it into something that's terrible, and then it ceases to come. So, and and actually reading, you know, reading is kind of crazy, but it just says, you know, I hope it'll be wonderful, but there are so, sometimes you feel alarmed now because you think, you know, what is it about the book? Do they like something about the book which makes me feel very easy? And I have a question about not so much adaptations, but actually your collaborative process of writing novels together, because I find it quite fascinating, especially in light of your comments that the uh, work of a novelist deals with this interiority, you sink into your own world. But how do you actually, I don't know, dive in and then pull yourself out? In order to be able to that's, that's, a, yeah. no, that's an interesting question because I know in a way you can see from what you believe because you would think, I think mean, you'd think that, that collaborating would be a more experienced thing, but I think in the world you can explain that. So we're writing together, and we write separately as well, but writing together is the same, a lot of it is the same process as writing separately. So it's what we never do is we never sit down together.
the voices on the voice the voice of 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 the the voice of the voice a bit more correct or a bit more compromising. And I think this really thing that sort of surprised me about collaborating is, is we, especially as we've gone, I think as we went on our, our email, our first few books, we really kind of prodded ourselves, as much as we sort of goad each other by, by going in and to push each other into kind of dark or weirder areas, maybe than we've not done, we've done on our own. It's, so it actually almost became more, and some of our books almost became more interior than they, than they might have been. Uh, but it's, um, it's, just, it's a funny, it's, it's a funny old thing to be doing. Yeah. Um, you talked about how you've um, sort of given up all the rights and like, let the screenwriter go at it, and how you guys have tried to adapt it, the screenplay to yourself. Have you ever sort of done a collaboration where you've worked with other screenwriters together, or is that something you guys would do? <laughs> you mean, I mean, I mean work with the screenwriter? Yeah, um, like, work with the screenwriter sort of you know, do you know, it's, it's really in, in terms of whether with, with the writers who um, adapted our books, and we, I, I, as I've already kind of suggested, sometimes, like with the land of the living, thing, we've, never, I mean, we've never seen anything at all. Like, no, we've no idea what it's like. The other times, usually with the TV adaptations, we've been sent the script. And it's frankly, it's kind of like the real delicate etiquette of it, because you can, you can sort of make certain kinds of um, uh, comments maybe as well maybe this is too big. But they're really not sending it for us to, set, to, to get the pen out and start rewriting it. And and and, and actually when we've met, you know, we've, we've met I think almost all of the people who adapted our TV versions, I think we've met the one who adapted the Kimmy Software. And there's a, it's almost like a kind of slate a strange kind of Freudian relationship because they're almost when you meet, at the, you know, when we met the people adapting our books, they were very polite. We you, you always have a slight suspicion that they, they, they prefer it to be dead. You know, because you know they, you don't, they don't want, you know, they don't really want you around just because you're going, you know, you're always having a battle. That like, who's ideal is this? You know, who, who, you know, because you know what, and, and that's in a way as it should be because I think for, for an adaptation to work, they shouldn't just feel they're serving what they think you would have written. Or they've got to have, take it and go run with it with their own imagination. Yeah, I think collaboration is really different. I don't know if you've done it, but I mean, I think working with somebody else and kind of taking the experience and kind of using voices as a hand is phenomenally difficult. But you have to be, you have to be, you have to kind of rate them and you have to trust them. And also, there's something like, uh, you have to be very, you have to lose your self consciousness. You know, when you write to them, it's just crucial to lose self consciousness, you're not sensitive. Gets a, a letter, threat, and she's been killed. 
and this is what she thinks. And we try to create phrases with them and touch and sort of the character doesn't know why she's being targeted. And, and, and it's interesting, some of, when you actually see someone playing, it, 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 it's definitely the young person play that role. It's so, she's so touching, and, he's, and that was, you know, you do feel there's certain cases where someone, an, an actor or actress, can really bring something, a kind of different dimension to it. Uh, and I think that was, you know, also, now I'm not even knowing the person who's in doing some drive with that. Mm -hmm. They were like a friend. And that she was, I thought, I mean, she's not really trained. And she was, I thought she was really, really, when we saw her, we read her as sass and then to all. You said it's uncharacteristic. She said, well, she, she's in a book, what the book is about. It's, it's like, it's a book about something. Mm -hmm. The woman played by and afraid that she discovers uh, there's a knot at all, and it's two police officers, and they come to tell her there's a husband who's died in a car crash, and he was with another woman. And so he's died, and it, the assumption is that he's having an affair, and she sets out to try and find out what happened, and it turns into a thriller. But actually, in, in a way, when you thought of the book, the all the kind of driving theme of it was grief and, and more. Stages of all these, and the of following these stages of numbness and rage and fury and grief. And she was just playing with it. So it was a very difficult part for her to play. She was just playing it full on. She was very, she was beautiful. She did it beautifully because she was somebody who, you know, the project was very beautiful and famous actresses are quite intimidating. They hold it arms then. But she was very intimate in that dreamy place. And not she was like a girl in the it really made me feel full of upset for this character that we created. And we didn't realise what we'd done to her. And, 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 and how it's a terrible time. She came to me and did this interesting thing in that book. She thinks back to her marriage and after that three book. And to do that, what they did is they, they brought her husband back to life. As a, like, she was like a ghost of grief that she would visit inside her. It was, it was very well done and very, very touching. So that was positive. And it was very, very sad. It was like, and then someone who suddenly saw your book it was a stranger. It's so it's possible to add information. Oh, oh, so much. Much. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, I mean, because in a way, one of the point, I mean, what I hope I hope you try to, one thing I hope you convey is that when when your book is adapted. You become a kind of stranger, you know, to it. You know, it, it, it really moves away from you in good ways, in, you know, in either in very good ways or bad ways or whatever. But whichever way, it's just not your, you know, it's, just, it's not your thing anymore. So there's always something slightly, you're, you do feel a bit when you see it for the first time, like it's just an interloper or something, something strange is happening. It's like everything's familiar, but it's, but it's not quite familiar. So it's still, so there's a whole place in my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Like, that's right. It's all, it's all it's all and you sensitize as well. It becomes everybody's. And nobody's really, your reading, your own book, it's no more correct than anyone else's reading is. It belongs to everybody. So you can be strange to that. Can I ask, uh, could you imagine finding a relationship, either a director or a producer, where you were working? Someone came, brought an idea, or brought a, a, a concept, or explored at the concept stage, and you wrote something, going through the kind of process that you've just described, as something that's kind of thought about as a as a film like from the start. Not taking from Yeah, but saying, you know, uh, and if so, who might? <laughs> if it were the rest of the who, who might? Have, you know, I did that. Is that? That's what we could have And in the way we do, we do think about that quite wishfully, I thought. And partly because of you know, writing the own lines, but somehow we can have a very rich experience of collaboration. So, yeah, so we, and we have, you know, actually, we are thinking about it. You know, it's very many of those and there's something going on in there. I mean, really, it's, it's in a way that I think we're very, you know, I think we'd be very, I mean, I think we'd actually be interested in that way of working. You know, having said that, uh, you know, we were saying before about the difference about working with, you know, with your publisher and working with you know, your the power you have as a screenwriter. But that could be, I mean, in a way, to say it's different is not saying it's worse. I mean, something that kind of collaboration would be, would be, uh, 
Amazing. As, but the, tr the trouble is, the, when you say who you want it to be, the, the, um, a lot of my, you know, when I think of favourite directors, the ones I go a million miles away from wanting to collaborate with, I mean, you know, when I mentioned Hitchcock, and Hitchcock just chewed up writers, you know, it's so, when you read about it, there was no fun at all being a screenwriter working with Hitchcock. And this, I think it's one of the worst being a screenwriter is having a book adapted by Hitchcock, because he had this way, he was so mean that he, he never buy a book directly, and he wouldn't buy the book directly. He'd send some person out to buy the rights. So, you know, so it wasn't, this is how Alfred Hitchcock said. Some bloke would come to your age and say, oh, can I just buy it? It's enough. It probably won't get paid. And, and that's what happened with Lo Sarko. Someone just came to French Robert Block, and he was virtually in a bar and said, oh, can I just buy the rights to the school? You know, for a few hundred dollars, he was somewhat on behalf of Hitchcock. So he was not a, he was not a generous collaborator. To him. In fact, I wrote him. Uh, I wrote a biography years ago, Patrick Hamilton, who wrote the original play of Rogue. And uh, he, uh, you know, and Patrick Hamilton was a very distinguished playwright. And when Hitchcock was, uh, was adapting Rogue, uh, Hamilton wrote the original version of the script and it was just one, the actual writing script, which was completely jumped. One was, he wrote the script, uh, we even Sidney Bernstein, and you know, who was the fan of Yonan, they wrote the script, which was then. Totally jumped, but without telling him. Uh, Hitchcock didn't even bother to tell Patrick Hamilton that he jumped. He then, with him, he, he with Hugh Cronin, wrote a completely new version in someone else. And then the first uh, Patrick Hamilton knew about this is when he when he uh, when, uh, when he saw it at this special screening, and he was deeply, deeply traumatized. I don't think anyone sees it. He knows where it is. Also, people who um, Patrick Hamilton was very complicated in sexuality. And, and wrote a very, very weird and gay transgressive adaptation of the book of the play. So I think he's a very unhappy, very unhappy man. Um, so I think like, what, what even more question I was answering. What do you mean? I mean, in a way, one of the things that is interesting in, in um, uh, I don't, uh, anyone who, uh, in, uh, um, I don't know if anyone who here is interested, is interested in screenplays, there's a fantastic podcast as well for listening to called Script Notes. Is done by somebody, uh, John August, a screenwriter, and Craig Mays, a very, very interesting about the whole business of screenwriting. And I, I, there's a little bit that John August has had a long relationship with working with Tim Burton. And I think there's something about where certain people, you know, they can, you know, where it's not just a one off relationship, but it's a kind of trust. You know, that they would, they would be, uh, is there a lot of also married couples who work with this screenwriters? That's right, yeah. versions done of that book, which is obviously a tribute to the quality of your books and, and the success of the adaptation of that But the, it, it seems to be kind of odd. Do you, you see, I mean, there is a kind of, there's the body of your work, and then there's a very substantial body of adaptation sort of sitting out there in the ether somewhere. Um, do you feel sort of utterly protected from it, in a sense? Well, do you see, in a sense of your reputation or the future, or do you do you worry about that at all? Because you talk almost perhaps rightly as if it exists as some kind of separate cloud in a sense that there's the there's the kind of Nicky French out there that's been adapted, and then there are the books. That's really interesting because actually that's how. Because you, so the way you talk, it seems you seem sort of remarkably <coughs> unfazed by the whole thing. Actually, as if it really is a kind of of a world that's been created which has no effect on you whatsoever. <laughs> I would think you know, no, no effect on whatever. So, I mean, the funny, I mean, the strange thing is, I mean, for, can I say this, 
I think in, I mean the it is interesting. We have we have just you know as I went through. I was always surprised myself as I was going through preparing this of how how many have been adapted. And and I always made kind of this. We were, we were having a conversation a couple of days ago about this. It's, I mean, it's very, very funny. People who have been adapted a lot. I mean, famous example is Stephen King, who's had not just, he's probably had about 40 films made with books, but he's certainly had about 10 and really good ones. Yeah, and it's, it's, whereas, you know, to, um, to take another group of, I was thinking of the really, the really great uh, recent uh, American writers, you know, Norman Mailer, John Updike, Philip Roth, and Saul Bellow. There are almost no films, and the, and the very few that have been made catastrophically bad. So it's very kind of puzzling why that should be. You know? um, but it's, um, what, what is your answer? Yeah, I see no idea what your answer is, but my answer is that almost quite like that. But it feels that you know, what we are responsible for is the making French books. And, and you know, we've, we've created those, those are ours. And if they get bad in the that hurts, that, that feels hurtful and sore, it does. And the films do, they belong to us, they, 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 you know, they're authors, and we're not the authors of those films. And I, I just put quite some touch. And I, you know, I really love, I really love those films. Fantastic films. Great in my hand books. I make me feel very comfortable and proud. It would, it's, I don't think when things go, I don't think that I feel... She didn't feel proud, because the film makes feel proud. It doesn't feel like it's got much to do with it. Also, there's almost there's whole different kinds of adaptations. So there are lots of books where actually... Which are, no, sorry, there are lots of films that are based on books where actually people wouldn't even know they were based on a book, or they wouldn't connect. Where, and there are just a few. There are some of these kind of really very common... Uh, things like, I mean, to take something like uh, Clockwork Orange, where, where the film and the book have almost merged into some complicated thing. And, you know, so, you know, yes, and then a few, a few like that. And, and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and, or, you know, of the thing someone like, actually, someone like Raymond Chandra, I'm sure people have different, almost the, the great, the film, the kind of, um, you know, the, uh, the Bogart, The Big Sleep, uh, and the novel The Big Sleep can be almost indistinguishable in your mind. But, but, but the funny thing is, I think, Bad, well, not bad adaptation. So, so the failures, like there's, you know, people probably haven't heard of the dire Michael Winner version of the, the with Robert Mitchum movie. You know, the no, that has been remembered. But I think you know, there is, you know, there's good adaptations. Also. So you mean it displays all the same good adaptations around it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
which seems a very weird distinction to make, saying, well, that was the best film, but it wasn't the best directed film, you know, whereas another one, that was the best directed, but it wasn't the best film, you know, the, and, but, and it's, in a way that seems just to apply also the screenplay, to, to the screenplays, to say, to say that had the best screenplay, but it wasn't the best film, or in some way, I don't, I don't know who is capable of making that sort of distinction. I mean, I, 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 mean, I was trying to think uh, if anyone would come up with an example of a really good screenplay for a really bad film. Or, or, or on the other hand, a really good film that had a really, but was good, but had a very bad screenplay. It seems to me almost impossible to imagine. Mm -hmm. well, that's just my opinion. Sorry, sorry. Tell us, sir. Yeah, no, it'd be really interesting if you come up with a, with a possible example. Cameron Sun. I do know when it says beautiful, you know, beautiful photography, it means it's very slow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I think when, when people say it's when well edited, it usually means that they've just had some scenes very fast, lots and lots of cuts. You know. So, um, it's, it's interesting. You seem to be very thorough at, at letting go of them when you when you finish them. You know, you, you, you say goodbye to them. And it's interesting that a lot of the themes are about grieving and loss. Actually, but you you say goodbye to your loss and you see them outside in in the world there. And it's, Possibly is why you're quite relaxed about adaptation. I mean, is this something that's grown as you've written more? That's so interesting. Because mm. I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think we are quite good at letting them go. I, you know, maybe that's part, part is to do it together. Somehow letting them go together it's a bit, a bit easier than if it was just our own model that we were letting go. And I think part of the thing is when you're writing a book, that's when it's so raw, you know, that if, you know, if, and when you're kind of struggling with it and the kind of things and, and it's halfway done, and then it's all kind of painful. And if someone could come in and comment on it at that point or, or try and adapt it while you were writing it, then it, then it would be just this horrible, painful mass. Once you sort of finished it and it's sort of, you know, and then... I, you know, I, I, I was saying earlier, I said, you know, I think that's the process of kind of going from this kind of painful, private, kind of tender feeling about your novel, and then you give it to your agent and then your publishers, and then people start to read it. And you do, it is, <coughs> you lose it, you do lose it, and that's because you, have to, because you have to lose it before you write your next novel. If you, write, you if you were still holding <coughs> on to it as if it's like some kind of sick child, then you wouldn't be able to be strong enough for your next novel. So you have to let it go. And it's quite interesting because I was in the hospital we were ten years ago, years ago or something. It doesn't feel you can read it like a stranger. You know it's you, but yes, you can read it like a stranger. What thing that brings me to the end of the project of writing and sending your notes on the script. <coughs> Part of it is such a familiar thing for screenwriters to get notes maybe not necessarily from the writers, but, you know, but also but that analytical process <coughs> of kind of seeing what the script should have consisted of, not because you object to a script being made, but kind of seeing where the point has been missed or um, and that, well, I was wondering how that process compared to your own kind of planning when you're planning your own plots or discussing the kind of strategies that, or you kind of using the analysis that you've already <coughs> come up with consciously or unconsciously. Well, I, think you, yeah, I, think the, I, mean, I think you, I mean, it's interesting because I, mean, I think when you're, I think we, well, to start reading a novel and reading a screenplay are really different things. And uh, it's because, they, I mean, because a screenplay is always, you know, that's not the work of art, you know, that's the kind of blueprint, but so it's, it's kind of the way you're looking at the kind of structure and how, and the flow of it. And it's more like a, and seeing how will it look on screen, and that's a difficult. So, you know, so in the way we look slight, that's why we felt slightly insecure about doing it. But I think what you, I think what we do, where that does hold what your, your comparison you're making, is I think when you look at it, when, you know, when we're planning a story and structure, you can you really always have to. Do, I think one of the things we're constantly asking ourselves: what is the kind? Of, what's the spine of this story? And, you know, and because in a way, every story is based, you know, 
really basically simple at its core. So you think, you know, is this true to this thing? Oh, have, have, have we lost the point of what, this, what the story is really about? And I think often when films, when you see a film that's gone wrong, you always feel as if it's a, and very often it's because the film's been rewritten so often. You know, it's as if they forgot why they were originally, what the idea of the film originally was. And, and I think you've got, you know, you've got to see what is the, you know, and, uh, you know, what, you know this, it doesn't mean it has to be, have to be, be mindless, but you do, you've got to, you know, and, it, and I think this applies just as much to an Ingmar Bergman film as it does to a James Cameron film. Is, you know, you've got, you know, the, the, it has to be kind of true to the logic of, of, of that world you're creating and that story. And I think you, 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 you know, you've got to, and then what, so I suppose what, one of the points that um, you know, sorry, it would have been in that case, there's, a kind of, there's often a real temptation writing thrillers, just put in another twist or have another, you know, or let's sort of make, let's make the murder turn out to be someone that they'll never suspect. It may be the reason that they'll never suspect it. Because it's ridiculous if they are a murderer. You know, so you've got, you've got to have, so in a way, you've got, you've got to have, I mean, the ideal thing in, say, in a thriller form is to have a surprise. But when the, when the reader or the viewer is surprised, they then think, yeah, but I'm surprised, but I can see it had to be that way. That's the only way it could be. You know, and, and, so, I mean, so I think there's that process that, that, that applies to both. Well, so I think the other process is about. When we're talking about, you know, often when we're planning, you know, or we're sta when we're standing back and trying to see how it's going, it's probably about kind of pace and shape, you know, the high points and the low points and slowing things down and speeding things up and changing things. And that would apply. But... Yeah. Just this question of logic in adaptation. Um, I, I'm, I'm... My train is late, so I must have first time talked, I'm sorry to tell this, but um, on the killing you suffer, it seems to me that you're saying there's a degree no logic, and I, I don't think I've encountered that before. I mean, normally when you get a bad adapt adaptation, you can see there's been a logic, it's just a kind of stupid logic. I mean, um, I know Harold Pinter and David Mann were both set to the asteroid, the screenplay for the Lita, and they both got rejected. And man had asked, supposedly asked the producer, why does this reject it? And said, the producer said, well, you can't make a film out of this screen, but you've made a guy look like a paedophile. <laughs> um, but you can see a logic. But I, I can't think of a case where, I was inferring from what you're saying, there was really no logic to what they'd done in the adaptation. I was wondering if you were given any insight into what they thought they'd do. Um, well, what I, what I can do, the, uh, I don't see it as about fighting an old battle 15 years too late. But, but like, I mean, anyway, the, don, the kind of the idea, the, the basic tonic of the, the idea that inspired the structure and we suffered it was, was just we, we had the idea, it was the idea of someone, you know, the, the way that we had a conversation about how when people fall in love, it's a strange process where you, you suddenly get obsessed with someone about whom you don't know, you don't know anything about them. And uh, you know, and yet you you, you, know, you invest with all this importance, and then you sort of you know, well, some of that them very quickly, and you just you don't know it. You know. And, and, and then we thought, how would we, you know, we, we could turn that? Like missing the night's dream, like going yeah. into dark woods, but then you come out as the world. You know, so we had the idea of what if someone, you know, well, if you just push that a couple of steps, that would be an interesting thriller. So some this woman in a kind of boring life suddenly meets this man who just falls in love with him, but she doesn't know anything about him, and then. Uh, and then it, it suddenly, it's, you know, it, it, the kind of things she's attractive about him uh, make him actually, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, dangerous. And then, and so, and then, it, and he becomes more and more dangerous. And it turns out that, you know, the question is, he really might be a, a, a murderer. And that was a kind of, you know, so, so it's the idea of someone who falls in love with a murderer. And then, what basically, you know, among many other, you know, often and the they, madness and the darkness at the heart of all of that. And that's, they uh, killed softly. They basically had a woman falling in love with a man who isn't a murderer, which kind of <laughs> you kind of think. So in a way, what saying is, think of why you wanted to make this film. You know, I mean, you know, what I mean, there's no point in doing this because that was the whole domain of it. You know, in a way, it's a bit. I mean, another where you think that lack of logic. I mean, I, I, there's a really, really clear, even clear example. I don't know if anyone's seen. You know, the wonderful Dutch film, The Vanishing. Anyone seen this? Which has got one of those frightening endings. I mean, the whole point of why it's so phrased about the woman who disappeared. 
uh, then the husband, the husband, his wife disappears at, at a petrol station, and the man, this whole film is finding where what's happened to her. And without giving away, you find in the last couple of minutes of the film, you find what has happened to this woman. And it is so. When I first saw it, it so I was so frightened. I thought I was having a heart attack. <laughs> they, they then bought it, remade it in America, uh, with Keith Sutherland starring in it, and changed the ending. I mean, the ending was the whole point of the film. It was why they bought it, why everyone, why it was such a good horror film, and why they remade it. But then they thought, oh God, we can't have this ending. It's too frightening. So they changed it. And so in a way, I think there is a kind of, you know, I think that, I think often, I think one of the things that, to, to go back to, you know, like when we were writing our books, is um, you to often have to kind of think, why did you, what was the idea, you know, you must stay true to this original idea you had, because there's this, you know, and this kind of logic to it. And I think sometimes in the screenwriting process, which often involves so much, so many people, so much time, so much rewriting, the heart gets left, 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 left. Do you have any personal like examples of um, maybe not your own work, but films that you like that you think that are better than books? Oh, that's really, that's well, really. Really good fun. I mean, I've tried. I think we had we had we had a couple conversations. I remember that this about we see we see the very interesting subject about what was the best book you could think of where the film is better than the book. And my in the example I, I think, I mean, I think it's the full, I think the film, I, I, no one else agrees with me about this, I have to say. I think the film of Atonement is better than the, than the, than the book. Um, mm -hmm. Some people think the leopard is better the than the book. Well, the leopard is, it's just a beautiful film, a beautiful book, so at least, you know, they're equivalent. I mean, I mean, there are lots. I mean, because there's, there's famously lots of great films are based on slightly second-rate books. I mean, I think the Magnificent Anderson's is much better than the new written novel. Yes, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about this for I mean, in a way, there are, there are um, just lots and lots of, I mean, you know, uh, I don't know what the book was, because it disappeared, and the film was taken over. I mean, The Shining, Stephen King's The Shining is a good, it's a really good book, actually, but The Shining, but it's Cupid's film, and it uh, might be better, and probably better. Isn't it that they might, some films might not be better than the book, but they might be more accessible to a different generation, or to people, for instance, the latest one in Heights, for instance, that I showed to a group of young people yeah. who absolutely loved it, but who mm -hmm. would never read the book. Would they read the book having seen the film? Because that's what published, you know, I all, these, they, they, all these books get re-released with kind of nice new jackets or the actresses based on it. I think some people would do that. I don't think, I think the language is too important for many young people, but some people would. Do you study that, the, like the genre that like you talked about, Stephen King and The Shining, or uh, maybe something like Patricia Highsmith or uh, uh, Daphne Du Maurier, where you have people who have been extraordinarily adapted? Mm -hmm. Do you kind of, is it to, given that your writing is both so visual and so interior, do you kind of go into well, I think something that you analyze. Well, I it's too formal. The point is, is what we do. I think one of the things is, is I think that when we do. We can read quite a lot of thrillers and see, and we see a lot of thrillers on TV, and, and I think we're constantly kind of sort of almost like dismantling it. And does this really, you know, does this work? Do we really believe this? You know, um, and we're very kind of. We can get very cross with endings. I mean, the, I mean, well, we were just, I mean, we, I mean yes, but things like, I mean, did, did anyone, did anyone watch The Bridge, for example? Did anyone see this? The, the uh, Danish, Swedish thing, which is, which is kind of, that was, uh, we thought as an example of how, if you've got very compelling central characters, you can get away with the most ridiculous, preposterous, meaningless story. I mean, I just, if they, I think that would be the thing, if anyone tried to watch it a second time, the madness of the of what this villain is meant to have done. So, so we're real sports, more boring kind of hang on, and that doesn't follow from that. Um, we, 
don't you know. And actually, I think films can get away with things in a way that books can't get away with them. I mean, because if there's, if there's kind of relaxing and relaxing and Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I think it's just that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a lot of our job is, is partly saying, and then that's what, in a way, one of the things I think you've got about, about the benefit of collaboration is you, there's a way which I think if you're writing on your own, you can, you can have a tendency to let yourself get away with things, whereas if you have someone else saying, hang on, would they really do that, or would that actually be possible, or, you know, so, um, <laughs> you look like a, in, in a policeman, you know, keeps control of that. So you lose your own in a policeman. Yeah, 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 um, Sean and Vicky, we have some wine and we're going to be out of here for another uh, hour and a half, so do stay and drink a glass of wine. Good I mean, I mean, you don't have to stay right here. Yeah. But we're, do stay and talk and drink wine. And, uh, pass around. But anybody who's not yet signed uh, the list of kind of presence. If you can sign it, that would be very useful because we kind of um, continue to argue our case for getting free seminar rooms and free classes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>